Hey guys, so today's activity is called the signature of the stars, which is looking at their light signature, aka the electromagnetic radiation that they release, and the kind of information that we can learn from that and how we can interpret it. So this is a graph I had up last week that looked at different temperatures of stars and for each one had its own line on the graph to show where the peak of its radiation is, where it's releasing the most of what kind of electromagnetic radiation. So we had uh, very, very hot stars are tending more towards the blue end of the visible spectrum or violet, ultraviolet, and the cooler stars end up in wavelengths uh, that are larger than visible light, so we can't see them. They, of course, emit a whole range. So the very bottom line there, the 300 Kelvin star, its peak is way off from the visible spectrum, but it is still releasing some light. So we would see that as a very, very dim star that's reddish, and then a very, very hot star. This one only goes up to 600, sorry, 6,000 Kelvin, but there'd be much, much more. A very hot star we would see is blue because more of the radiation being released is towards the blue end of the spectrum. So we experience this as color, we experience this as brightness, and then the question for today is uh, how we can interpret that information. So all of this energy is being released in the core. This is where nuclear fusion is happening. We talked about that a couple of lessons ago where the energy is being released in these reactions in the core of the star. And then if you imagine it like a little ball, it's not actually a literal uh, object, but if you imagine it like that, it's moving through the material of the sun and bumping into atoms along the way. So instead of having this nice straight path, there's the fusion core, instead of this nice straight path happening out to the surface of the sun and then being released out into the atmosphere, they end up hitting things and bouncing along the way and not creating a straight path, but encountering a lot of other atoms, a lot of material on its way through the the sun itself coming from the core. And what happens is that the material that's within the sun absorbs some of that energy. So if you think back to chemistry, um, hydrogen is kind of a bad example of this because there's only one electron in it, but if you remember some of the other elements and their energy levels, this is a vaguely Bohr-ish diagram for now, what happens when the energy coming from fusion interacts with nuclei along the way through the, the material of the star itself, it can cause electrons to jump up energy levels. So this electron that maybe is in the first shell um, can be, can jump up to a higher shell, or maybe an electron that is out here is going to jump up to the third shell. And that takes energy. So this is what these dark lines are in the electromagnetic spectrum. In theory, all of the wavelengths of visible light are released, but what happens is that these transitions will absorb specific wavelengths of light to make that jump happen. So these are going to be specific to each element. So the spacing of the energy orbitals is going to be different for different elements. We didn't really talk about that too much, um, but you can imagine that if you have something uh, towards the metal side of the periodic table, it has some number of protons in the center and it has its shells. As you move to the right through the periodic table, you have the same three shells, but you have more of a positive charge in the center. You have more protons. So those shells are actually brought in a little bit. They're not at exactly the same distance. It would still have three, but those three would be slightly closer in than their counterparts in a metal or in an element further to the left along the periodic table. So these lines are very specific to individual elements. I think I'm gonna get rid of my uh, drawings here for a moment. So these spectral lines absorbed are the exact ones that correspond to electrons making the jump to higher shells or higher energy levels within the atoms of the sun itself. The dark lines are the specific wavelengths corresponding to the specific energy move needed to move from one to the next one. So this particular pattern here is for hydrogen. Each element is going to have its own different pattern, and we're going to take a look at that in a minute. But what it means is that we can use these patterns to determine what elements are present in a star. 
So this is a diagram that comes from page 340 of your textbook. So you are going to need your book for this next part. If you don't have your book, um, the easiest thing to do is probably to get this image from your screen somehow, as long as it's not too blurry. So what this diagram is about is showing how showing some of the different spectral lines for different elements and then how we can use those lines to determine what a particular star is made of. So I'm going to use the ruler on my screen here to demonstrate how to read this diagram uh, and then you are going to do it for yourself on page 340. I'm not using it as a ruler to take measurements, I'm more just using it as a straight edge to line up uh, different rows of this diagram. So I have here the spectral patterns for hydrogen, helium, sodium, calcium, and mercury. And how I determine what any star is made of is that I look at the lines that are present in its spectrum, and I line up the dark lines from that star to the reference ones above to figure out what's present. Sometimes it's a little tricky. I have to check and make sure that it is in fact the element that I'm looking at that is what lines up. Some of them are quite close together. So the first thing I notice about the sun, and actually about all of these mystery stars, is that they all have this dark line right here that corresponds to hydrogen. I'm just going to make this bigger. They all have this dark line that corresponds to hydrogen. So all four of these stars have hydrogen in them, which kind of makes sense. And then I can do that for any of the other lines that are present in a star's spectrum. I can line up a straight edge, and I have to match both the placement and the relative thickness of those lines to be sure that that is the one that is present for that particular star. So I can do that for each one and after a while I can use that information to determine what elements are present in that star. 